That was great. Great overview, Stephen. And um, I know when I was involved with comparative effectiveness in the company and trying to get the legislation passed and everything else for Procore and other pieces of it, uh, the industry was against cost, you know. But my idea was you get the, the effectiveness first and then cost comes because my original roots are in cost effectiveness analysis. I helped start uh, PCORI and, I mean, uh, ISPOR and was involved with that. But that's how I see it. And I, and I agree with you on the, uh, the payer, the individual patient being involved. They are definitely going to be involved and be looking for that cost quality uh, information. Okay, our last speaker. Uh, Michael Painter, uh, uh, from a provider system perspective. Uh, he's Senior Program Officer of Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, he's a Lead Program Officer on a $15.8 million program to aggregate national health plan data, construct performance measures, and develop uh, ep episode of care cost measures, and also Program Officer for the Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Program. He was a uh, Johnson Fellow, as I was a uh, Johnson Fellow. Uh, he's formerly officer for a large episode of care uh, payment reform project uh, from Metheus uh, Payment uh, from 2008 to 2011. Can you hear me? Am I on? Great. Hi, everybody. Uh, Michael Painter. Um, I am indeed a senior program officer at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. I bet I have a disclosure statement. I don't have any disclosures. Um, I do have uh, a plug, though. I, um, I'm a sort of a social media guy, and, uh, so, uh, and I'm not a big business card guy, but um, I am on Twitter, and so I can't tell if you guys look like Twitter people. Maybe not. I don't know. But if you are, uh, please follow me. I'd love to have the conversation with you, and uh, we have a lot of fun. I'm at PaintMD on Twitter. If Twitter isn't your thing, I'm on LinkedIn, so you can um, follow me there. And if you prefer Facebook, um, just friend me, and I will and remind me where we met, and I'll, I'll probably friend you. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. We have a lot of fun there. So, um, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. I before I get started, um, how many people think that when you have uh, when you and your healthcare provider, you the, the, your physician or nurse practitioner or whoever you use in a healthcare clinical setting. When you guys make a decision, how, 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 do you think that that's based on the best results for you, the highest value? Raise your hand if you do. Well, all too often, um, those decisions are not based on that and, and, and on that information, unfortunately. And that information gap is a lot of what we've been talking about here, here today. And, um, it is really important. Um, uh, as we know and as we sort of have alluded to, there's a, a, a significant healthcare care dysfunction in the United States healthcare system. We don't even really have a system, but in the United States healthcare. And the good news is um, there is a, a transformation, um, so to speak, underway. Um, and a lot of people have been, um, the prior speakers have been talking about this healthcare transformation. So that is the good news. That's what um, Steve was talking about. That's what Brian was talking about, the things that they're witnessing and experiencing and seeing. Um, and a lot of this you could sort of boil down into a, a quest for value. We don't have that now. We have all these quality and safety problems that Steve was talking about. We have this sort of exploding costs and, and, and all that problem. So to that stew together is a, an intense value problem, and we really need to get a handle on it. And one of the things we're missing in that search for value is, is information, a lot of kinds of information that inform decisions, and that inform how we pay for care, um, that inform how we um, uh, engage um, all the various stakeholders, the employers, the health plans, the consumers, patients, um, and physicians, and nurses, and hospitals. So uh, today, I'm going to, if, if actually, if you don't remember anything else from my presentation, um, I, I guess the thing I'd like you to, to remember most is that this information that uh, Dave and the team at PCORI are, are working on, this, this patient outcome information, is unbelievably urgent. We really, really need it. And this point about cost, I'm wrapping that, that information about results that matter to people um, wrapped with the cost is, a, is sort of a national urgency. And so um, that's basically what I'm going to talk about, is sort of putting this in context, um, talking about why we need this information, and sort of compare you know, how we sort of operate in various other walks of our lives, and then sort of the, the hope, 
promise and potential of the PCORI effort to get this information for us. And just again, wrapped in this really this sort of, it's urgent and that we get this. So, um, but first, uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, um, that's uh, where I work. Uh, I have been there, I'm in my ninth year now. I'm a family physician and an attorney. Uh, I, I, as um, John Paul mentioned, I got to the foundation um, by way of my uh, health policy fellowship, um, the Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellowship, which took me to Washington, D.C. I worked with Senator Bill Frist in the Majority Leader's Office, which was an exciting and wonderful thing to do. And, and the, the uh, senior management then um, um, recruited me to come to the foundation. And, and I've been there working on this quality, cost, and value dilemma with uh, my colleagues at the foundation. Since then, we are uh, the nation's largest foundation devoted to improving health and health care. We're a, about a, a $10 billion foundation. When that, that sort of translates into we have to give away to maintain our, our tax exempt status about almost $500 million every year. And we do all of that to sort of devise and uh, programs to try to address these problems in health and health care. So just even today, uh, a number of the things that we talked about, uh, Steve mentioned the Beth McGlynn study, which was an expensive study at the time, over $10 million, we funded that. Um, folks mentioned the uh, IOM comparative effectiveness report, we funded that. I'm gonna mention the, the IOM uh, a better care, um, best care at lower cost um, report from last year, and we funded that. So we do a lot of things. Those are the kinds of things we do, including some of the, the payment reform efforts that, that we mentioned um, in my resume and things like that. So that's, that's what we do, and that's what I do. So comparative effectiveness. This is a quote that sort of popped out um, um, to me by Steve Neeson, uh, Dr. Steve Neeson from the Cleveland Clinic, and basically just sort of Again, saying how important this, this outcomes um, information is, this evidence that we need, um, and, and uh, particularly in the United States because we have some, such in, uh, in a, a, a very, very low cost-effective medicine. It seems like, well, we have the best medicine in the world. Maybe we don't, and in, in any event, we spend a lot of money um, to get maybe we don't kind of medicine. And, uh, so this isn't just an interesting kind of esoteric health policy fellows kind of chat about this problem. Um, it's sort of at the core, this, this healthcare quality, cost, value um, dilemma is at the core of a lot of the division we have, our partisan um, uh, discord in Washington, these intense fiscal um, discussions we're having and brinksmanship, or, or if you boil them down, most often they sort of come right back down to these entitlements and particularly to healthcare. It's really putting us in a bind as a country. And so that's part of the urgency, a big part of it. But that's not the only part, and I'll talk about this. This is this um, Institute of Medicine report um, from last year that I mentioned, and I was the program officer on, th on this one as well. Um, we, um, we thought it was really important, I advocated at the foundation, it was really important to help support the IOM in this um, project because it was, it was the first time they really got um, behind this notion about the, the value problem. They'd, they talked about, they had a crossing the quality chasm report back in the early 2000s, a safety report right before that. And so they were obviously four square behind those problems, but they really hadn't put it together with this cost piece to get to make the point about value. And uh, they did a terrific job with this report last year. It got a ton of press. There's some numbers there. The sort of healthcare spending constitutes of almost a fifth of our economy in the United States. So that's, 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 a, that's a big chunk of our economy. That might not be bad. Um, like you said, Uwe Reinhardt doesn't think it's that bad. But this other number is kind of interesting. The $750 billion, billion of waste per year. Wow. So that, that sounds like a lot of money. Um, but how do you sort of get your head around that? And, I don't, again, I don't know if you're social media people, but there is a, there's a, a, a character, E. Patient Dave, who is in those circles. And uh, I was on the phone talking with him the other day, and he said the way he puts his head around it is um, uh, he, he started adding up all the profits from the major corporations in the United States, like Apple and Intel and all these um, big companies, and it doesn't add up to $750 billion. So that's a big, 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 big number. Um, and, and it's wasteful, but it's also... Uh, a ton of opportunity for us to, to improve. And uh, several folks mentioned, I'm just, this is just, a, it's a little bit dated slide, but just again, again to put in context the opportunity we have in the United States to improve our care. Uh, we spend head and shoulders, our nearest, this is the per capita spending um, in the United States compared to all these other major nations, and um, we're $2,000 per person ahead of anybody else, um, uh, so at least. This is another uh, slide from that IOM um, best care at, at low, um, uh, 
at lowest price, lower um, cost um, report. And the point here is that, again, there are all these opportunities in the way we provide care and um, prevention, the way all of us as, as patients and consumers manage our um, health care problems, the way we interact um, with our, the, in the outpatient setting and the way the outpatient um, 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 health care professionals interact with each other. Um, problems there, problems in the hospital, problems when we have to come back to the hospital um, and we shouldn't. Um, so those are, those are all problems. They're safety problems, they're quality problems, they're expense problems, but they're also a ton of opportunity for us um, to improve. There's a ton of low-hanging fruit there to get at that $750 billion worth of waste. But that's where it lives. That's where the waste lives. I wanted to sort of pause, a, a number of people have, have alluded to this transparency point and some other things, and, and my point here is about transparency, but it's also about information and the way our expectations about information in our lives these days, and how um, when, for instance, this example is obviously orbits, in fact, it was, a, it was almost a travel um, a, a trip I was planning, but just sort of a screenshot of, of that, and we think, we, we demand this kind of information. We wouldn't, we wouldn't think twice about um, uh, making a, a, a travel decision without seeing all the carriers, kind of rudimentary quality, you know, the baggage costs, um, am I gonna have a, lay, a, a, a stop or non-stop and how much is it going to cost and make a decision based on that. We don't have anything like that in healthcare, but hopefully we will. And so this is just sort of making that point. Not only are we as, as um, um, patients and consumers um, um, without information, shockingly, um, are, uh, almost all the stakeholders are um, in many respects about price, and cost, spending actually that, that national expenditure number that we that in that slide I showed, we kind of can get a handle on the national spending, but these this price, the prices like this, what do I pay for this the service or for a whole um, uh, episode of care that I need the, for the whole from when I got sick to what I what happened to me and did I get well that price that bundled price do we know that no we don't um, does anybody else probably they don't um, maybe you guys in the plans do I don't know um, but uh, um, we don't have that kind of information to make these decisions and in the outcomes um, we don't have that kind of information either um, um, very often um, and so we need it and we need it um, um, why this slide is about um, when we talk about healthcare spending, it's just important to sort of keep in mind. We sort of talked about the fiscal cliff and sequestration and all that stuff, but there is a there's sort of public spending on healthcare, Medicare, Medicaid, federal entitlements, and that's really important. But there's sort of private spending on healthcare as well, and just sort of they're related, um, but they're different, and uh, and so and, and they affect each other. But you have to sort of keep in mind that these two sort of um, uh, um, uh, baskets of spending in, in in healthcare in the United States. This is a slide from uh, uh, the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, a report. This their, their long range report that they issued in June of last year in the sort of run up to the fiscal cliff discussion. And they just sort of baldly say, well, the way we're doing things now and the budget, um, our our, the, our approach and particularly with um, public um, uh, spending of healthcare, that's what they're talking about, um, that's not gonna work. We gotta change. Um, we don't have any choice. There's really n no way back now. And then, later on in that same report, they sort of say this kind of accounting, economist kind of, they just sort of blithely say this, the, the size of, they, they, they assume this sizable slowdown and excess cost growth that is going to happen, um, uh, probably cannot be uh, can only be achieved through significant changes in the nature of healthcare. So they just say that it's sort of like they just assume we're going to do this, and it's going to take a lot of the things that Steve was talking about, and 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 information that that Dave and and and, and team are, are are creating for us. But it's it's interesting that that they just assume that because here's the list of what what are we going to do to sort of achieve that vision, that assumption that they made in the in the report, and so that's getting this outcomes information, the cost spending and price information. There's other sort of um, important things that the federal government needs to fix, like the, the sort of zombie problem with the sustainable growth rate. That's a whole nother talk. The Independent Payment Advisory Board, which is another um, um, Affordable Care Act um, uh, uh, agency maneuver that has some um, um, uh, potential, but is controversial as well. These payment and um, reforms and delivery system reforms and on and on. The insurance markets um, that folks were talking about um, that are um, going to come online in 2014. And then this, this 
ability to create the outcomes information that we so desperately need, the comparative effectiveness research. So there's a lot of hope with that. And then, again, this is just sort of a, a general definition of comparative effectiveness research. And again, it's just the, to make the point that it's to get this information on outcomes that results that matter to people, decision makers, so that we can make smart, well-informed decisions. The, in the Affordable Care Act, they changed this definition. I think it was John Paul that mentioned it. They call it a comparative clinical effectiveness um, research, which sort of takes it out, takes that, and the point in the IOM report sort of takes out the cost part, unfortunately, which as we showed, we desperately need. So it's kind of crazy when you think about where we're at that we're not um, 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 as hard as we can studying that as well, but, but we're not doing that. Um, but we do have PCORI now, and um, it's terrific, and there's a lot of hope, and there's a lot of funding for that. It has a lot of challenges, um, too, uh, and not the least of which are it's in this, it's, it's trying to uh, uh, get up and going in the midst of all the health reform controversy and partisan bickering and, and divide, and uh, uh, you could imagine there are definitely critics, and you seem like such a calm guy, and, but I mean, I imagine it's, it's can be, there's some controversy about, well, this research, is this going to enhance our choice or is it going to limit our choice? Is this the road to rationing or what? So that you could get that kind of um, criticism. There are, um, certainly will probably be and are um, uh, concerns about why are we spending all this money on this kind of research. Uh, I understand that built into the law, the, the funding, the, the funding for PCORI comes from, I guess, uh, $150 million from the, uh, the Treasury, and then a tax, um, uh, uh, um, a dedicated tax. Um, but all that ends in September of 2019. Um, and so the, the, it, all, it, it, it all goes away unless Congress <laughs> is able to agree again and reauthorize it. So you sort of have six years to get this thing up and going. And uh, so there, uh, that's in the face of how urgently we actually really need this information. Um, and then there are these other challenges, um, like, uh, um, so do we study head-to-head uh, -head treatments and devices and what's gonna work better? And th those are kind of often expensive, and are we looking for more expensive things um, and ways to do things, and it's just sort of incremental uh, differences in, pro uh, in effectiveness? Or are we really looking at um, other kinds of things um, that's important. There's this other um, bit about uh, another challenge for PCORI is you sort of almost seem like you're uh, forming a, a mini NIH and sort of trying to rapidly get this thing up to speed in the face of all this um, uh, controversy and urgency. So that seems like a huge challenge. And then there's this bit about, uh, well, what should you be studying? And uh, um, this is a quote from Atul Gawande, who is, uh, if folks know, a surgeon and a, a terrific author. Um, books and essays, and um, and he just notes that this, all the, the 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 devices and the treatments, it's all terrific. But what we really need is that that second category that Dave showed in his in the in the priorities about the systems. Um, what's what works? What kind of accountable care organizations work? What about um, on these? the hot spotter kinds of things. What about this organization of care and this innovation versus that one? How are we gonna get, what's the best way to do this um, and how can we learn about that quickly and then start innovating and doing that? We really, really need to know that um, to get at that $750 billion of waste that we're, that are, we're saddled with. And then um, I'm gonna leave you with, uh, um, I'm not a researcher, just a family doc and an attorney, and I spend time um, with colleagues uh, thinking about these, these, um, these uh, higher level um, policy issues, but there is a methodology question, and you, you put, they've put up the, 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 the methodology guidelines that they have, but there's this question, I guess, about, uh, well, randomized controlled trials are expensive, they're time consuming, they're the gold standard, it's the best way we know how to get this, this evidence, but are we really gonna be able to do that on all these decisions that we have to, we have, it's all this information we have to accumulate to make all these decisions? Isn't there a better way um, for us to, get, can we sort of tweak the research science so we can rapidly get good enough information so that we can start building out what we need as fast as possible in this nationally urgent effort? And so there, are, this is from Scientific American and a couple of years before PCORI, I guess, but uh, it, um, it just sort of talks about, well, 
in an, in an, an automated environment where you have data that's autom automated and, and in the clinical elect electronic record, it's sort of big data um, um, uh, assets, isn't there a way to sort of go in there and start to assess those assets and, 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 and make some comparative effectiveness determinations based on that? Then it's, that approach, of course, is criticized because it's observational um, and it has all the risks um, um, from, um, uh, with observational um, uh, research. But um, we, need, we need better ways to do this. And uh, um, uh, um, it'd be interesting to hear what the other panelists had to say about that. So again, we're on the quest for value, and uh, um, it's urgent that we get there. Thanks a lot.